I present to you episode one of Morbid Curiosity. Dynasty, what's up, dude? I'm about to do something I've never done before. I hope you stick around. This is actually going to be a live, um, like a podcast format. But um, just watch. I, I've been, this has been a lot of work in the making. I just finished it tonight, like right before I started looking, finished up, took a shower. And I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to do it tonight. Hope you guys like it. Um, fuck. I'm fucking nervous, dude. All right. You love serial killers? This is going to be bad. This is going to be very disturbing, dude. Uh, I'm sure you might be aware of what Jeffrey Dahmer did, but hope you enjoy. In a world where humans strive to reach new amazing heights, we're countered by our villainously new lows. Violence, death, and despair run rampant. Our fascination with outlandish and gruesome events borders on obsessive. And now, we succumb to our addiction. Jeffrey Lionel Dahmer was born at the Evangelical Deaconess Hospital in Milwaukee, Wisconsin on May 21, 1960, the first of two sons born to Joyce and Lionel Dahmer. Dahmer's mother worked as a teletype machine instructor and his father was a student at Marquette University. His father was of German and Welsh ancestry and his mother of Norwegian and Irish. It has been claimed that Dahmer was deprived of attention as an infant. Other sources, however, suggest that generally Dahmer was doted upon as an infant and toddler by both parents. Although his mother was known to be tense, greedy for both attention and pity, and argumentative with her husband and their neighbors. As her son entered first grade, Joyce Dahmer began to spend an increasing amount of time in bed recovering from weakness. Lionel's university studies kept him away from home much of the time. When he was home, his wife demanded constant attention. She reportedly worked herself into a state of anxiety over trivial matters simply to appease her husband. On one occasion, Joyce Dahmer attempted suicide from an overdose of Equinil pills to which she had become addicted. Consequently, neither parent devoted much time to their son.
Dahmer has been described as being an energetic and happy child until he became noticeably subdued after undergoing a double hernia surgery, which was performed shortly before his fourth birthday. He recalled his early years of family life as being of extreme tension, which he noted between his parents. Dahmer also observed them to be constantly arguing with each other. At elementary school, he was regarded as both quiet and timid by his peers. On his first grade report card, one teacher described Dahmer as a reserved child whom she sensed felt neglected. The teacher did note that this sense of neglect seemed to stem from his mother's illnesses. Nonetheless, although largely reserved and uncommunicative, uncommunicative in grade school, Dahmer did have a small number of friends from an early age and Dahmer manifested an interest in dead animals. Friends later recalled Dahmer initially collected large insects, such as dragonflies and butterflies, which he placed inside jars. Later, he collected animal carcasses from the roadside. Occasionally accompanied, accompanied by one or more of his few friends, he dismembered these animals either at home or in an expanse of woodland behind the family home. According to one friend, Dahmer had dismembered these animals and stored the parts in jars in the family's wooden tool shed, always explaining that he was curious as to how each animal, quote unquote, fitted together. In one instance, he decapitated the carcass of a dog before mailing or nailing the animal's body to a tree. He later impaled the skull of this dog upon a stake beside a wooden cross in woodlands behind his house. Dahmer's fascination with dead animals might have begun when, at the age of four, he noted his father removing animal bones from beneath the family home. According to Lionel Dahmer, his son was quote unquote oddly thrilled by the sound of the, the by the sound the bones made, and instantly developed a fixation for playing with and collecting animal bones. He occasionally searched beneath and around the family home for additional bones. With live animals, he explored their bodies to discover where their bones were located. The Dahmer family relocated to Doylestown, Ohio in October 1966. At the time, Joyce Dahmer was pregnant with their second child. When she gave birth to a baby boy on December 18, 1966, Jeffrey was allowed to choose the name of the baby. He chose the name David for his younger brother. The same year, Lionel Dahmer achieved his degree and subsequently obtained employment as an analytical chemist in the city of Akron, Ohio. In 1968, the Dahmer family relocated to Bath, Ohio. Two years later, over a family meal of chicken, Dahmer asked his father what would happen if the bones of the chicken were to be placed in a bleach solution. Lionel Dahmer was, by this stage, concerned as to his elder son's placid and lethargic attitude and his solitary existence. Therefore, he was delighted at the initiative displayed by his son towards what he believed to be a scientific curiosity. He willingly demonstrated to his son how to safely bleach and later preserve animal bones. Dahmer used this knowledge regarding the cleansing and preserving of bones on many of the animal, animal remains which he continued to avidly collect. From his freshman year at Revere High School, Dahmer was seen by his peers as an outcast with few friends. Many of Dahmer's classmates later recollected being disturbed by the fact that he drank both beer and hard alcohol, which he smuggled into school inside the lining of his army fatigue jacket, 
and concealed in his locker. The drinking occurred before, during, and after school, and was first noted when Dahmer was 14. On one occasion, a classmate observed Dahmer consuming a cup of gin and asked him why he was drinking, uh, drinking liquor in class, to which Dahmer casually replied, It's my medicine. In his freshman year at Revere High School, Dahmer, although largely uncom uncommunicative, was observed by staff to be a polite student who was known to be highly intelligent. He initially achieved only average grades, which staff attributed to his apathy. He was also known to have been a keen tennis player and to have briefly played in the high school band. When he reached puberty, Dahmer discovered he was gay. He did not divulge his sexual orientation to his parents. In his early teens, he did engage in a brief relationship with another youth, although the pair never had intercourse. By his later admission, he began sexually fantasizing about dominating and controlling a completely submissive male partner. These fantasies gradually became intertwined with dissection. On one occasion, when he was approximately 16 years old, Dahmer conceived a rape fantasy of rendering unconscious a particular male jogger he found attractive, and then making sexual use of his unconscious body. To render the man unconscious, Dahmer concealed himself in the bushes on the route he had noted the jogger took, baseball bat in hand, and lay in wait for him to run by. The jogger did not pass by on that particular day, however. Although Dahmer never attempted to implement this plan again, he later stated that this was his first attempt to attack another individual. Despite being regarded as a loner and an oddball among his peers at Revere High School, Dahmer became something of a class clown among some of the students due to the pranks he regularly staged, some of which were done to amuse his classmates, others apparently to simply attract attention. These pranks became known as doing a Dahmer and included bleeding, simulating epileptic seizures or cerebral, cerebral palsy, and knocking over items at school and at local stores. By 1977, Dahmer's grades had declined, owing to his alcohol abuse and his continuing apathy towards academic and social interactions. His parents hired a private tutor for their son, but the tutor only had limited success. The same year, Dahmer's parents attended counseling sessions to try to resolve personal differences and thus save their marriage. This counseling was ultimately unsuccessful, and they decided to divorce. Although initially on amicable grounds, both of the Dahmer's parents began to quarrel frequently in the presence of their sons, and in early 1978, Lionel Dahmer moved out of the house. In May 1978, Dahmer graduated from high school. A few weeks before his graduation, one of his teachers observed Dahmer sitting close to the school parking lot, drinking several cans of beer. When the teacher threatened to report the matter, Dahmer informed him that he was experiencing quote unquote, a lot of problems at home and that the school's guidance counselor was aware of them. Shortly after this incident, Joyce was awarded custody of her younger son and vacated the family residence, moving in with family members of hers. Dahmer, having just turned 18, was legally an adult and therefore not subject to court custodial considerations. Chapter 2 Uncaged Dahmer committed his first murder in the summer of 1978 
at the age of 18, just three weeks after his graduation. At the time, he was living alone in the family home. Owing to his recent divorce from Dahmer's mother, Dahmer's father temporarily, temporarily lived in a nearby motel and his mother had relocated to Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin. On June 18th, Dahmer picked up a hitchhiker by the name of Stephen Mark Hicks, who was four days shy of his 19th birthday. Dahmer lured the youth to his house on the pretext of the two men two young men drinking alcohol together. Hicks, who had been hitchhiking to a rock concert in Lockwood Corners, agreed to accompany Dahmer to his house. According to Dahmer, after several hours drinking and listening to music, Hicks wanted to leave, and I didn't want him to. In response, Dahmer bludgeoned him with a 10-pound dumbbell. Dahmer later, Dahmer later stated that he struck Twix. Dahmer later stated that he struck Hicks twice from behind with a dumbbell as Hicks sat upon a chair. When Hicks fell unconscious, Dahmer strangled him to death with the bar of the dumbbell, then stripped the clothes from Hicks's body before masturbating as he stood above the corpse. The following day. Dahmer dissected Hicks's body in the basement, and he later buried the remains in a shallow grave in his backyard. Several weeks later, unearthed the remains and paring the flesh from his bones, he dissolved the flesh in acid, and before flushing the solution down the toilet, he crushed the bones with a sledgehammer and scattered them into the woodland behind his family home. Six weeks after the murder of Hicks, Dahmer's father and his fiance returned to his home where they had discovered Jeffrey living alone at the house. That August, Dahmer enrolled at Ohio State University, hoping to major in business. Dahmer's sole term at Ohio State University was completely unproductive, largely because of his persistent alcohol abuse throughout the majority of the term. He received failing grades in Introduction to Anthropology, Classical Civilizations, and Administrative Science. The only course Dahmer was successful at was Riflery, having received a B- a grade. His overall GPA? 0.45 over 4. On one occasion, Lionel Dahmer paid a surprise visit to his son, only to find his room strewn with empty liquor bottles. Despite his father having paid in advance for the second term, Dahmer dropped out of university after just three months. In January 1979, on his father's urging, Dahmer enlisted in the U.S. Army, where he trained as a medical specialist at Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio, Texas. On July 13, 1979, he was stationed in Baumholder, West Germany, where he served as a combat medic in the 2nd Battalion, 68th Armored Regiment, 8th Infantry Division. According to published reports, in Dahmer's first year of service, he was an quote-unquote average or slightly above average soldier. Two soldiers attest to have been raped by Dahmer while in the army. One stated in 2010 that Dahmer had repeatedly raped him over a 17-month period while they were both stationed at Baumholder, while another soldier believes Dahmer drugged and raped him inside an armored personnel carrier in 1979. Owing to Dahmer's alcohol abuse, his performance deteriorated, and in March 1981, he was deemed unsuitable for military service, and he was later discharged from the army. He received an honorable discharge as his superiors did not believe that any problems Dahmer's ha Dahmer had in the army would be applicable to civilian life. On March 24, 1981, 
Dahmer was sent to Fort Jackson, South Carolina, for debriefing and provided with a plane ticket to travel anywhere in the country. Dahmer later told police he could not return home to face his father, so he opted to travel to Miami Beach, Florida, both because he was quote-unquote tired of the cold and in an attempt to live by his own means. In Florida, Dahmer found employment at a delicatessen and rented a room in a nearby motel. Dahmer spent most of his salary on alcohol and was soon evicted from the motel for non-payment. He initially spent his evenings on the beach as he continued to work at the sandwich shop until phoning his father and asking to return to Ohio in September of the same year. After his return to Ohio, Dahmer initially resided with his father and stepmother and insisted on being delegated numerous chores to occupy his time while he looked for work. He continued to drink heavily, and two weeks after his return, Dahmer was arrested for drunk and disorderly conduct, for which he was fined $60 and given a suspended 10-day jail sentence. Dahmer's father tried unsu unsuccessfully to wean his son off alcohol. In December 1981, Dahmer's father and stepmother sent him to live with his grandmother in West Allis, Wisconsin. Dahmer's grandmother was the only family member to whom he displayed any affection. They hoped that her influence, plus the change of scenery, might inspire Dahmer to refrain from alcohol, find a job, and live responsibly. Initially, Dahmer's living arrangements with his grandmother were harmonious. He accompanied her to the church, willingly undertook chores, actively sought work, and abided by most of her house rules, although he did continue to drink and smoke. This new influence in his life initially brought results, and in early 1982, Dahmer found employment as a phlebotomist at the Milwaukee Blood Plasma Center. He held this job for a total of 10 months before being laid off. He remained unemployed for over two years, during which he lived upon whatever money his grandmother gave him. Shortly before losing his job, Dahmer was arrested for indecent exposure. On August 7, 1982, at Wisconsin State Fair Park, Dahmer was observed to expose himself to a crowd of 25 women and children. For this incident, he was convicted and fined $50 plus court costs. In January 1985, Dahmer was hired as a mixer at the Milwaukee Ambrosia Chocolate Factory, where he worked from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m., six nights per week. With, Sunday, with Saturday evenings off. Shortly after Dahmer found this employment, an incident occurred in which he was propositioned by another man while sitting reading in the West Alice Public Library. The stranger threw Dahmer a note offering to pro perform fellatio upon him. Although Dahmer did not respond to this proposition, the incident stirred in his mind the fantasies of control and dominance he had developed as a teenager, and he began to familiarize himself with Milwaukee's gay bars, bookstores, and gay bathhouses. He's also known to have stolen a male mannequin from a store, which he briefly used for sexual stimulation until his grandmother discovered the item stowed in a closet and demanded that he discard it. By late 1985, he had begun to regularly frequent the Milwaukee bathhouses, which he later described as being, quote-unquote, relaxing places. But during his sexual encounters, he became frustrated at his partners moving during the sexual act. Following his arrest, he stated, I trained myself to view people as objects of pleasure instead of people. For this reason, beginning in June 1986, he administered sleeping pills to his partners, giving them liquor laced with the sedatives, then raping their unconscious bodies. After approximately 12 such instances, the bathhouse's administration revoked Dahmer's membership, and he began to use hotel rooms to continue this practice. Shortly after his membership of the bathhouses was revoked, Dahmer read in a report in a newspaper regarding the upcoming funeral of an 18-year-old male. 
he conceived the idea of stealing the freshly interred corpse and taking it home. According to Dahmer, he attempted to dig the coffin from the ground, but found the soil too hard before abandoning the plan. In August 1986, Dahmer was arrested for masturbating in front of two 12-year-old boys as he stood close to the Kinnikinnik River. Dahmer initially admitted the offense was and was again charged with indecent exposure, but quickly changed his story and claimed he had merely been urinating, unaware that there were witnesses. The charge was changed to disorderly conduct, and on March 10, 1987, Dahmer was sentenced to one year probation. With additional instructions, he was to undergo counseling. It's a lot harder than I thought it would be. I still have 109 more fucking frames to go. All right, let's uh, let's keep going, huh? No bully hunter moments. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Interesting stream idea. As unsavory as the subject matter is, I like the I the I like the live edit narrative concept. Yeah, this is my first time doing it, so it's it's really hard trying to figure out everything. Like I have notes on here. I don't know. You can see kind of how this all fucking looks. Um, I appreciate it, man. Power slide. And a power slide. And it made a power slide. All right. I need to stay with it. Here we go. Chapter 3 The Milwaukee Cannibal On November 20th, 1987, Dahmer, at the time residing with his grandmother in West Allis, Wisconsin, encountered a 25-year-old man from Ontonagon, Michigan, named Stephen Tuomi, at a bar. Dahmer persuaded him to return to the Ambassador Hotel in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where Dahmer had rented a room for the evening. According to Dahmer, he had no intention of murdering Tuomi, but rather intended to drug and rape him as he lay unconscious. The following morning, however, he awoke to find Tuomi lying beneath him on the bed, his chest crushed in, black and blue with bruises. Blood was seeping from the corner of his mouth, and Dahmer's fist and one forearm were extensively bruised. Dahmer stated he had no memory of having killed Tuomi, and later informed investigators that he quote-unquote could not believe this had happened. To dispose of Tuomi's body, he purchased a large suitcase in which he transported the body to his grandmother's residence. There, one week later, he severed the head, arms, and legs from the torso, then filleted the bones from the body before cutting the flesh into pieces small enough to handle. He then placed the flesh inside plastic garbage bags. He wrapped the bones inside a sheet and pounded them into splinters with a sledgehammer. The entire dismemberment process took Dahmer approximately two hours to complete and disposed all of Tuomi's remains, excluding the severed head, in the trash. For a total of two weeks following Tuomi's murder, 
Dahmer retained the victim's head wrapped in a blanket. After two weeks, Dahmer boiled the head in a mixture of Soylix, an alkali-based industrial detergent, and bleach in an effort to retain the skull. He then used the skull as stimulus for masturbation. Eventually, the skull was rendered too brittle by this bleaching process, so Dahmer pulverized and disposed of it. Following the murder of Tuomi, Dahmer began to actively seek victims, most of whom he encountered in or close to gay bars, and whom he typically lured to his grandmother's home. There, he drugged them before or shortly after engaging in sexual activity with them. Once he had rendered the victim unconscious with sleeping pills, he killed them by strangulation. Two months after the murder of Stephen Tuomi, Dahmer encountered a 14-year-old Native American male prostitute named James Dockstater. Dahmer lured the youth to his home with an offer of $50 to pose for nude pictures. At Dahmer's West Alice residence, the pair engaged in sexual activity before Dahmer drugged Dockstader and strangled him on the floor of the cellar. Dahmer left the body in the cellar for one week before dismembering it in, the, in much the same manner as he had with Tuomi. He placed all of Dockstader's remains, excluding the skull, in the trash. He then boiled the skull and initially retained it before pulverizing it. Richard Guerrero. Dahmer lured Guerrero to his grandmother's residence, although the incentive on this occasion was $50 to simply spend the remainder of the night with him. He then drugged Guerrero with sleeping pills and strangled him with a leather strap. Dahmer then performed oral sex upon the corpse. Guerrero's body was dismembered within 24 hours of his murder, with the remains again disposed of in the trash and the skull again retained before being pulverized several months later. On April 23rd, Dahmer lured another young man to his house. However, after giving the victim a drugged coffee, both he and the victim heard Dahmer's grandmother call, Is that you, Jeff? Although Dahmer replied in a manner that led his grandmother to believe he was alone, his grandmother did observe that Dahmer was in fact not alone. Because of this, Dahmer opted not to kill this particular victim, instead waiting until he had become unconscious before taking him to the county general hospital. In September 1988, Dahmer's grandmother asked him to move out of her house because of his habit of bringing young men to her house late at night and the foul smells emanating from both the basement and the garage. Dahmer found a one-bedroom apartment on North 25th Street and moved into his new residence on September 25th. The following day, Dahmer was arrested for drugging and sexually fondling a 13-year-old boy whom he had lured to his home on the pretext of posing for nude photographs. In January 1989, Dahmer was convicted of second-degree sexual assault and of enticing a child for immoral purposes. Sentencing for the assault was suspended until May 1989. On March 20th, Dahmer commenced a 10-day Easter absence from work, during which he moved back into his grandmother's house. Two months after his conviction and two months prior to his sentencing for the sexual assault, Dahmer murdered his fifth victim. He was a mixed-race, 24-year-old aspiring model named Anthony Sears, whom Dahmer met at a gay bar on March, 5th, March 25th, 1989. According to Dahmer, on this particular occasion, he was not looking to commit a crime. However, shortly before closing time that evening, Sears, quote-unquote, just started talking to me. Dahmer lured Sears to his grandmother's home, where the pair engaged in oral sex before Dahmer drugged and strangled Sears. 
The following morning, Dahmer placed the corpse in his grandmother's bathtub where he decapitated the body before attempting to flay the corpse. He then stripped the flesh from the body and pulverized the bones, which were again disposed of in the trash. According to Dahmer, he found Sears exceptionally attractive, and Sears was the first victim from whom he permanently retained any body parts. He preserved Sears' head and genitalia in acetone and stored them in his work locker. When he moved to a new address the following year, he took the remains there. On May 23rd, 1989, Dahmer was sentenced to five years probation and one year in the House of Correction, with work release permitted in order that he be able to keep his job. He was also required to register as a sex offender. Two months before his scheduled release from the work camp, Dahmer was paroled from, his, from this regime. His five years probation imposed in 1989 began at this point. On release, Dahmer temporarily moved back to his grandmother's home in West Allis before, in May 1990, moving into the Oxford Apartments located on North 25th Street in Milwaukee. Although located in a high crime area, the apartment was close to his workplace, was furnished, and at $300 per month, inclusive of all bills excluding electricity. On May 14th, 1990, Dahmer moved out of his grandmother's house and into 924 North 25th Street, apartment number 213, taking Anthony Sears' mummified head and genitals with him. Within one week of moving into his new apartment, Dahmer had killed his sixth victim, Raymond Smith. Smith was a 32-year-old male prostitute whom Dahmer lured to the apartment 213 with the promise of $50 for sex. At Dahmer's apartment, he gave Smith a drink laced with seven sleeping pills and manually strangled him. The following day, Dahmer, pur Dahmer purchased a Polaroid camera with which he took several pictures of Smith's body in suggestive positions before dismembering him in the bathroom. He boiled the legs, arms, and pelvis in a steel kettle with Soilex. This allowed him to then rinse the bones in the sink. He dissolved the remainder of Smith's skeleton, excluding the skull, in a container filled with acid. Dahmer later spray painted Smith's skull, which he placed alongside the skull of Anthony Sears upon a black towel inside a metal filing cabinet. Approximately one week after the murder of Raymond Smith, on or about May 27, Dahmer lured another young man to his apartment. On this occasion, however, Dahmer himself accidentally consumed the drink laden with sedatives. When he awoke the following day, he discovered his intended victim had stolen several of his items. $300, items of clothing, and a watch. Dahmer never reported this incident to the police, although on May 29th, he divulged to his probation officer that he had been robbed. In June 1990, Dahmer lured a 27-year-old acquaintance named Edward Smith to his apartment. He drugged and strangled Smith. On this occasion, rather than immediately acidifying the skeleton or repeating previous processes of bleaching, which had rendered previous victims' skulls brittle, Dahmer placed Smith's skeleton in his freezer for several months in the hope that it would not retain moisture. The reason the skeleton did not remove moisture, and the skeleton of this victim would be acidified several months later. Dahmer accidentally destroy destroyed the skull when he placed it on the oven to dry, a process that caused the skull to explode. Dahmer himself was later would Dahmer himself was to later inform police that he had felt rotten about Smith's murder as he had been unable to retain any parts of his body. Less than three months after the murder of Smith, Dahmer encountered a 22-year-old Chicago native named Ernest Miller on the corner of North 27th Street. Miller agreed to accompany Dahmer to his apartment for $50 and further allowed him to listen to his heart and stomach. 
When Dahmer attempted to perform oral sex upon Miller, he was informed, That'll cost you extra. Whereupon Dahmer gave his intended victim a drink laced with two sleeping pills. On this occasion, he had only two sleeping pills to give his victim. Therefore, he killed Miller by slashing his carotid artery with the same knife he used to dissect his victim's bodies. Miller bled to death within minutes. Dahmer then posed the nude body for various suggestive Polaroid photographs before placing the body in his bathtub for dismemberment. Dahmer repeatedly kissed and talked to the severed head while he dismembered the, re while he dismembered the remainder of the body. He wrapped Miller's heart, biceps, and portions of flesh from the legs in plastic bags and and portions of flesh from the legs in plastic bags and placed them in the fridge for later consumption. Dahmer boiled the remaining flesh and organs into a jelly-like substance, quote unquote, using Soilex, which again enabled him to rinse the flesh rinse the flesh off the skeleton. To, pre to preserve the skeleton, he placed the bones in a light bleach solution for 24 hours before allowing them to dry upon a cloth for one week. The severed head was initially placed in the refrigerator before also being stripped of flesh, then painted and coated with enamel. Three weeks after the murder of Ernest Miller on September 24th, Dahmer encountered a 22-year-old man at the Grand Avenue Mall, David Thomas. Dahmer persuaded him to return to his apartment for a few drinks with additional money on offer if he would, if he would pose for photographs. In his statement to police after his arrest, Dahmer stated that, after giving Thomas a drink laden with sedatives, he did not feel attracted to him, but was afraid to allow him to awaken in case he would be angry over having been drugged. Therefore, he strangled him and dismembered his body, intentionally retaining no body parts whatsoever. He photographed the dismemberment process and retained those photographs, which later aided in Thomas's subsequent identification. Following the murder of David Thomas, Dahmer did not kill anyone for almost five months Although on minimum of five occasions between October 1990 and February 1991, he unsuccessfully attempted to lure men to his apartment. He's also known to have regu regularly complained of feelings of both anxiety, depression, and to his probation officer throughout 1990, with frequent references to his sexuality, his solitary lifestyle, and financial difficulties. On several occasions, he is also known to have referred to harboring suicidal thoughts. February 1991 Dahmer observed a 17-year-old named Curtis Strouder standing at a bus stop near Marquette University. According to Dahmer, he lured Strouder into his apartment with an offer of money for posing for new photographs with the added incentive of sexual intercourse. Dahmer drugged and strangled Strouder with a leather strap, then dismembered him, with Dahmer retaining the youth's skull, hands, and genitals, photographing each stage of the dismemberment process. Less than two months later, on April 7th, Dahmer encountered a 19-year-old named Errol Lindsay walking to get a key cut. Dahmer lured Lindsay to his apartment, where he drugged him, drilled a hole in his skull, and poured hydrochloric acid into the, into the open orifice. According to Dahmer, Lindsay awoke after this experiment, which Dahmer conceived in the hopes of inducing a permanent, unresistive, submissive state, saying, I have a headache. What time is it? By 1991, fellow residents of the Oxford Apartments had repeatedly complained to the manager of the Oxford Apartments, Sopa Princewell, of the foul smells emanating from apartment 213. In addition, the sounds of falling objects and occasional sound of a chainsaw disturbed neighbors. 
Prince Will did contact Dahmer in response, in response to these complaints on several occasions, although Dahmer initially excused the odors emanating from his apartment as being caused by his freezer breaking, causing the contents to become, quote unquote, spoiled. On later occasions, he informed Prince Will that the reason for the resurgence of the odor was that several of his tropical fish had recently died and that he would take care of the matter. On the afternoon of May 26th, 1991, Dahmer encountered a 14-year-old boy named Konarak Smith Synthasomophone, Synthasomophone on Wisconsin Avenue. Jesus Christ. He approached the youth with an offer of money to accompany him to his apartment to pose for Polaroid pictures. According to Dahmer, Synthasomophone, the younger brother of the boy whom he had molested in 1988, was initially reluctant to the proposal, before changing his mind and accompanying Dahmer to his apartment, where the youth posed for two pictures in his underwear, before Dahmer drugged him into an unconsciousness and performed oral sex on him. On this occasion, Dahmer drilled a single hole into Synthasomophone's skull, through which he injected hydrochloric acid into the frontal lobe. Before Synthasomophone fell unconscious, Dahmer led the boy into his bedroom, where the body of 31-year-old Tony Hughes, whom Dahmer had killed three days earlier, lay naked on the floor. According to Dahmer, he quote-unquote believed that Synthasomophone saw the body, yet did not react seeing the bloated corpse most likely because of the effects of the sleeping pills he had ingested and the hydrochloric acid Dahmer had injected through his skull. Synthasomophone soon became unconscious, whereupon Dahmer drank several beers while laying alongside Synthasomophone before leaving his apartment to drink at a bar, and then purchase more alcohol. In the early morning hours of May 27th, Dahmer returned towards his apartment to discover Synthasomophone sitting outside naked on the corner of 25th and State, talking in Lao, with three distressed young women standing near him. Dahmer approached the trio and explained to the women that Synthasomophone, whom he referred to by an alias, was his friend, and attempted to lead him to his apartment by the arm. The three women dissuaded Dahmer, explaining that they had phoned 911. Upon the arrival of two officers named John Balserac and Joseph Gabrish, Dahmer's demeanor relaxed. He informed the officers, officers that Synthasomophone was his 19-year-old boyfriend, that he had drank too much following a quarrel, and that he frequently behaved this manner when intoxicated. The three women were exasperated, and when one of the trio attempted to indicate to one of the officers that Synthasomophone was bleeding from the buttocks, and that he had been that he had seemingly struggled against Dahmer's attempts to walk him out to his apartment. The officer harshly informed her to butt out, shut the hell up, and to not interfere, and that the incident was quote unquote domestic. Against the protests of the three women, the officer simply covered Synthasomophone with a towel and walked him to Dahmer's apartment, where, in an effort to verify his claim that he and Synthasomophone were lovers, Dahmer showed the officers the two semi-nude Polaroid pictures that he had taken of the youth the previous evening. The officers later reported having noted a strange scent reminiscent of excrement inside of the apartment. The odor emanated from the decomposing body of Hughes. Dahmer stated that to investigate this, one officer simply peeked his head in the, inside the bedroom, and but didn't really look around. The officers then left with a departing remark that Dahmer take good care of Synthasomophone. Had they, done a, had they conducted a background check on Dahmer, it would have revealed that he was a convicted child molester under probation. Upon the departure of the two police officers from his apartment, Dahmer again injected hydrochloric acid into the Synthasomophone's brain. On this second occasion, the injection proved fatal. The following day, May 28th, Dahmer took a day's leave from work to devote himself to the dismemberment of the bodies of Synthasomophone and Hughes. He retained both victims' skulls.
On June 30th, Dahmer traveled to Chicago, where he encountered a 20-year-old named Matt Turner at a bus station. Turner accepted Dahmer's offer to travel to Milwaukee for, for a promotional photo shoot. At Dahmer's apartment, Dahmer drugged, strangled, and dismembered Turner, and placed his head and internal organs in separate plastic bags in the freezer. Turner was not reported missing. July 5th, five days later. Dahmer lured 23-year-old Jeremiah Weinberger from a Chicago bar to his apartment on the promise of spending the weekend with him. He drugged Weinberger and twice injected boiling water through his skull, sending him into a coma from which he died two days later. On July 15th, Dahmer encountered 24-year-old Oliver Lacey at the corner of 27th and Kilbourne. Lacey agreed to Dahmer's ruse of posing nude for photographs and accompanied him to the apartment, where the pair engaged in tentative sexual activity before Dahmer drugged Lacey. On this occasion, Dahmer intended to prolong the time he spent with Lacey while alive. After unsuccessfully attempting to render Lacey unconscious with chloroform, he phoned his workplace to request a day's absent. absence. This was granted, although the next day he was suspended. After strangling Lacey, Dahmer had sex with the corpse before dismembering him. He placed Lacey's head and heart in the refrigerator and his skeleton in the freezer. Four days later, on July 19th, Dahmer received word that he was fired. Upon receipt of this news, Dahmer lured 25-year-old Joseph Braidhoff to his apartment. Braidhoff was strangled and left lying on Dahmer's bed covered with a sheet for two days. On July 21st, Dahmer removed these sheets to find the head covered in maggots, whereupon he decapitated the body, cleaned the head, and placed it in the refrigerator. He later acidified Braidhoff's torso, along with those of the other two victims killed within the previous month. Chapter 4 The Darkness Fades On July 22, 1991, Dahmer approached three men with an offer of $100 to accompany him to his apartment to pose for nude photographs, drink beer, and simply keep him company. One of the trio, 32-year-old Tracy Edwards, agreed to accompany him to his apartment. Upon entering Dahmer's apartment, Edwards noted a foul odor and several boxes of hydrochloric acid on the floor, which Dahmer claimed to use for cleaning bricks. After some minor conversation, Edwards responded to Dahmer's request to turn his head and view his tropical fish, whereupon Dahmer placed the handcuff upon his wrist. When Edwards asked what's happening, Dahmer unsuccessfully attempted to cuff his wrists together, then told Edwards to accompany him to the bedroom to pose for nude pictures. While inside the bedroom, Edwards noted nude male posters on the wall and that a videotape of The Exorcist 3 was playing. He also noted a blue 57-gallon drum in the corner, from which a strong odor emanated. Dahmer then brandished a knife and informed Edwards he intended to take nude pictures of him. In an attempt to appease Dahmer, Edwards unbuttoned his shirt saying he would allow him to do so if he would remove the handcuffs and put the knife away. In response to this promise, Dahmer simply turned his attention towards the TV. Edwards observed Dahmer rocking back and forth and chanting before turning his attention back to him. He placed his head on his chest, listened to his heartbeat, and with the knife pressed against his intended victim, informed Edwards he intended to eat his heart. In continuous attempts to prevent Dahmer from attacking him, Edwards repeated that he was Dahmer's friend, that he was not going to run away. Ed
Edwards had, to Edwards had decided he was going to either jump from a window or run through the unlocked front door upon the next available opportunity. When Edwards next stated that he needed to use the bathroom, he asked if they could sit with a beer in the living room, where there was air conditioning, to which Dahmer consented. The pair walked to the living room, and Edwards exited the bathroom. Inside the living room, Edwards waited until he observed Dahmer have a momentary lapse of concentration before requesting to use the bathroom again. When Edwards rose from the couch, he noted Dahmer was not holding the handcuffs, whereupon Edwards punched him in the face, knocking Dahmer off balance, and ran out the door. At 11.30pm on July 22nd, Edwards flagged down two Milwaukee police officers at the corner of 25th Street. The officers noted Edwards had handcuffs attached to his wrist, whereupon Edwards explained to the officers that a freak, quote-unquote, had placed the handcuffs upon him and asked that the police could remove them. When the officers' handcuff keys failed to fit the brand of handcuffs, Edwards agreed to accompany, uh, Edwards agreed to accompany the officers to the apartment where, Edwards, uh, Edwards stated, he had spent the previous five hours escaping. When the officers arrived at apartment 213, Dahmer invited the trio inside and acknowledged he had indeed placed the handcuffs upon Edwards, although he offered no explanation as to why he had done so. At this point, Edwards divulged to the officers that Dahmer had also brandished a large knife upon him and that, he, and that this had happened in the bedroom. Dahmer made no comment to this revelation, indicating to one of the officers, Rolf Mueller, that the key to the handcuffs was in his bedside drawer in the bedroom. As Mueller entered the bedroom, Dahmer attempted to pass Mueller to himself retrieve the key, whereupon the second officer present, Robert Routh, informed him to back off. In the bedroom, Mueller noted that there was indeed a larger knife beneath the bed. He also saw an open drawer which, upon closer inspection, contained scores of Polaroid pictures, many of which were of human bodies in various stages of dismemberment. Mueller noted that the decor indicated that they had been taken in the very apartment in which they were standing. He walked into the living room to show them to his partner, uttering the words, These are for real. When Dahmer saw that Mueller was holding several of his Polaroids, he fought with the officers in an effort to resist arrest. The officers quickly overpowered him, cuffed his hands behind his back, and called a second squad car for backup. At this point, Mueller opened the refrigerator to reveal the freshly severed head of a black male on the bottom shelf. As Dahmer lay pinned on the floor beneath Ralph, he turned his head towards the officer and muttered the words, For what I did, I should be dead. A more detailed search of his apartment conducted by the Criminal Investigation Bureau revealed a total of four severed heads in Dahmer's kitchen. A total of seven skulls, some painted, some bleached, were found in Dahmer's bedroom and inside a closet. In addition, investigators discovered collected blood drippings upon a tray at the bottom of Dahmer's refrigerator, plus two human hearts and a portion of arm muscle each wrapped inside plastic bags upon the shelves. In Dahmer's freezer, investigators discovered an entire torso, plus a bag of human organs and flesh stuck to the ice at the bottom. Elsewhere in apartment 213, investigators discovered two entire skeletons, a pair of severed hands, two severed and preserved penises, a mummified scalp, and in the 57-gallon drum, three further dismembered torsos dissolving in the acid solution. A total of 74 Polaroid pictures detailing the, detailing the dismemberment of Dahmer's victims were found. In reference to the recovery of body parts and artifacts in 924 North 25th Street, the chief medical examiner later stated, it was more like dismantling someone's museum than an actual crime scene. Beginning in the early hours of July 23, 1991, Dahmer was questioned by Detective Patrick Kennedy as to the murders he had committed and the evidence found at his apartment. 
over the following over the following two weeks, Kennedy and later Detective Patrick Murphy conducted numerous interviews with Dahmer, which, when combined, totaled over 60 hours. Dahmer waived his right to have a lawyer present throughout the interrogations, adding he wished to confess all he had, confess all as he had, quote unquote, I created this horror, and it only makes sense I do everything to put an end to it. He readily admitted to having murdered 16 young men in Wisconsin since 1987, and one further victim, Stephen Hicks, killed in Ohio back in 1978. Most of the victims had been rendered unconscious prior to their murder, although some had died as a result of having acid or boiling water injected into their brain. As he had no memory of the murder of Tuomi, he was unsure whether he was unconscious when beaten to death, although he did concede it was possible that his viewing the exposed chest of Stephen Tuomi while in a drunken stupor may have led him to unsuccessfully attempt to tear Tuomi's heart from his chest. Almost all the murders Dahmer committed after moving to the, into the Oxford apartments had involved the ritual of posing the victims' bodies in suggestive positions, typically with a chest thrust outwards prior to the dismemberment. He readily admitted to performing necrophilia with several of the victims' bodies, including performing sexual acts with their viscera as he dismembered their bodies in his bathtub. Having noted that much of the blood pooled inside, the vi inside his victim's chest after death, Dahmer, Dahmer first removed their internal organs, then suspended the torso so the blood drained into his bathtub before dicing any organs he did not wish to retain and paring the flesh from the body. The bones he wished to dispose of were pulverized or acidified, with Soilex and bleach solutions used to aid in the preservation of the skeletons and skulls he wished to keep. In addition, he confessed to having consumed the hearts, livers, biceps, and portions of thighs of several victims killed within the previous year. Describing the increase in his rate of killing in the two months prior to his arrest, he stated he had been completely swept along with his, consum consum com Jesus. his compulsion to kill, adding, it was an incessant and never-ending desire to be with someone at whatever cost. Someone good-looking. Really nice-looking. It just filled my thoughts all day long. When asked as to why he had preserved a total of seven skulls and the entire skeletons of two victims, Dahmer stated he had been in the process of constructing a private altar of the victim's skulls, which he had intended to display on the black table located in his living room and upon which he had photographed the bodies of many of his victims. This display of skulls was to be adorned at each side with the complete skeletons of Ernest Miller and Oliver Lacey. The four severed heads found in his kitchen were to be removed of all flesh and used in this altar, as was the skull of at least one future victim. Incense sticks were to be placed at each end of the black table of which Dahmer intended to place a large blue lamp with extending blue globe lights. The entire construction was to be placed before a window covered with a black, opaque shower curtain in front of which Dahmer intended to sit in a black leather chair. When asked in a November 18th, 1991 interview who the altar was dedicated to, Dahmer replied, Myself. It was a place where I could feel at home. He further described his intended altar as a place for meditation, from where he believed he could draw a sense of power, adding, If this arrest had happened six months later, that's what would have been found. On July 25th, 1991, Dahmer was charged with four counts of first-degree murder. By August 22nd, he had been charged with a further 11 murders committed in the state of Wisconsin. On September 14th, investigators in Ohio, having uncovered hundreds of bone fragments in woodland behind the, behind the address in which Dahmer had confessed to killing his first victim, formally identified two molars and a vertebrae with x-ray records of Stephen Mark Hicks. Three days later, Dahmer was charged by authorities in Ohio 
with the murder of Stephen Hicks. Dahmer was not charged with the attempted murder of Tracy Edwards, nor with the murder of Stephen Tuomi. He was not charged with Tuomi's murder because the Milwaukee County District Attorney only brought charges where murder could be proven beyond a reasonable doubt, and Dahmer had no memory of actually committing this particular murder, for which no physical evidence of the crime existed. At a scheduled preliminary hearing on January 13, 1992, Dahmer pleaded guilty, but insane, to 15 counts of murder. Jeffrey Dahmer's trial began on January 30th, 1992. He was tried in Milwaukee for the 15 counts of first degree murder before Judge Lawrence Graham. By pleading guilty on January 13th to the charges brought against him, Dahmer had waived his rights to an initial trial to establish guilt. The issue debated by opposing counsels at Dahmer's trial was to determine whether he had suffered from either a mental or a personality disorder. The prosecution claiming that any disorders did not deprive Dahmer of the ability to appreciate the criminality of his conduct or to deprive him of the ability to resist his impulses. The defense arguing that Dahmer suffered from a mental disease and was driven by obsessions and impulses he was unable to control. Defense experts argued that Dahmer was insane to his, due to his necrophilic drive his compulsion to have sexual intercourses with corpses. Defense expert Dr. Fred Berlin testified that Dahmer was unable to conform, con conform his conduct at the time that he committed the crimes because he was suffering from paraphilia or, more specifically, necrophilia. Dr. Judith Becker, a professor of psychiatry and psychology, was the second expert witness for the defense. Becker also diagnosed Dahmer with necrophilia. The final defense expert to testify, forensic psychiatrist Dr. Carl Wallstrom, diagnosed Dahmer with borderline personality disorder, schizotypal personality disorder, necrophilia, alcohol dependence, and a psychotic disorder. The prosecution rejected the defense's argument that Dahmer was insane. Forensic psychiatrist Dr. Philip Resnick testified that Dahmer did not suffer from primary necrophilia because he preferred live sexual partners as evidenced by his efforts to create unresistant, submissive sexual partners devoid of rational thought and to those and to whose needs he did not have to cater. Another prosecution expert to testify, Dr. Fred Fosdell, testified to his belief that Dahmer was without mental disease or defect at the time he committed the murders. He described Dahmer as a calculating and cunning individual, able to differentiate between right and wrong, with the ability to control his actions. Although Fosdell did state his belief that Dahmer suffered from paraphilia, his conclusion, Dahmer was not a sadist. The final witness to appear for prosecution, forensic psychiatrist Park Dietz. He began his testimony on February 12th. Dietz testified that he did not believe Dahmer to be suffering from any mental disease or defect at the time he committed the crimes, stating, Dahmer went to great lengths to be alone with his victim and to have no witnesses. He explained that there was, there was ample evidence that Dahmer prepared in advance for each murder, therefore his crimes were not impulsive. Although Dietz did concede any acquisition of a paraphilia was not a matter of personal choice, he also stated his belief that Dahmer's habit of becoming intoxicated prior to committing each of, the, each of the murders was significant, stating, If he had a compulsion to kill, he would not have to drink alcohol. He had to drink alcohol to overcome his inhibition to do the crime which he would rather not do. Dietz also noted that Dahmer strongly identified with evil and corrupt characters from both Return of the Jedi and The Exorcist III, particularly the level of power held by these characters. Expounding on the significance of these movies, Dahmer's psyche and many of the murders com committed at the Oxford Apartments, Dietz explained that Dahmer occasionally viewed scenes from these films before searching for a victim. Dietz diagnosed Dahmer with substance use disorder, paraphilia, 
schizotypal personality disorder. Two court-appointed mental health professionals testifying independently of either prosecution or defense were forensic psychiatrist George Palermo and clinical psychologist Samuel Friedman. Palermo stated that the murders were the result of a pent-up aggression within himself. He killed those men because he wanted to kill the source of his homosexual attraction to them. In killing them, he killed what he hated in himself. Palermo concluded that Dahmer was a sexual sadist with antisocial personality disorder, but legally sane. Friedman testified that it was longing for companionship that caused Dahmer to kill. He stated, Mr. Dahmer is not psychotic. He spoke kindly of Dahmer, describing him as a amiable, pleasant to be with, courteous, with a sense of humor, conventionally handsome, and charming in a manner. He was, and still is, a bright young man. He diagnosed Dahmer with a personality disorder not otherwise specified, featuring borderline, obsessive-compulsive, and sadistic traits. The trial lasted two weeks. On February 14th, both counsels delivered their closing arguments to the jury. Each counsel was allowed to speak for two hours. Defense attorney Gerald Boyle argued first, repeatedly harking to the testimony of the mental health professionals, almost all of whom had agreed Dahmer was suffering from a mental illness. Boyle argued that Dahmer's compulsive killings have been a result of, quote-unquote, a sickness he discovered, not chose. Boyle portrayed Dahmer as a desperately lonely and profoundly sick individual, so out of control he could not conform his conduct anymore. Following the defense counsel's 75-minute closing argument, Michael McCann delivered his closing argument for the prosecution, describing Dahmer as a sane man in full control. He simply strove to avoid detection. McCann argued that the act of murder was committed in hostility, anger, resentment, frustration, or hatred, and that the 15 victims for whose murder he was tried died merely to afford Dahmer a period of sexual pleasure. McCann further argued that by pleading guilty but insane to the charges, Dahmer was seeking to escape responsibility for his crimes. On February 15th, the court reconvened to hear the verdict. Dahmer was ruled to be sane and not suffering from, any, from any mental, mental disorder at the time of each of the 50 murders for which he was tried. Although in each count, two of the 12 jurors sig signify their dissent. On the first two counts, Dahmer was sentenced to life imprisonment plus 10 years. With the remaining 13 counts, a mandatory sentence of life imprisonment plus 70 years. The death penalty was not an option for Judge Graham to consider at the penalty phase as the state of Wisconsin had abolished capital punishment in 1853. Upon hearing of Dahmer's sentencing, his father Lionel and stepmother Shari requested to be allowed a 10-minute private meeting with their son before he was transferred to Columbia Correctional Institution in Porte, in Porte to, begin his, to begin his sentence. The request was granted. The trio exchanged hugs and well wishes before Dahmer was escorted away to begin his sentence. Three months after his conviction for 15 murders in Milwaukee, Dahmer was extradited to Ohio to be tried for the murder of his first victim, Stephen Hicks. In a court hearing lasting just 45 minutes, Dahmer again pleaded guilty to the charges and was sentenced to a 16th life term on May 1st, 1992. Upon sentencing, Dahmer was transferred to the Columbia Correctional Institution in Portage, Wisconsin. 
For the first year of his incarceration, Dahmer was placed in solitary confinement due to his concerns for his physical safety should he come into contact with fellow inmates. With Dahmer's consent, after one year in solitary confinement, he was transferred to a less secure unit where he was assigned a two-hour daily work detail cleaning the toilet block. Shortly after completing his lengthy confessions in 1991, Dahmer had requested to Detective Patrick Murphy that he be given a copy of the Bible. This request was granted. Dahmer gradually devoted himself to Christianity and became a born-again Christian. On his father's urging, he also read creationist books from the Institute for Creation Research. In May 1994, Dahmer was baptized by Roy Ratcliffe, a minister in the Church of Christ and a graduate of Oklahoma Christian University. In the prison whirlpool. Following his baptism, Ratcliffe, Ratcliffe visited Dahmer on a weekly basis up until November 1994. Dahmer and Ratcliffe regularly discussed the prospect of death, and Dahmer questioned whether he was sinning against God by continuing to live. Referring to his crimes in a 1994 interview with Stone Phillips on Dateline NBC, Dahmer had stated, If a person doesn't think that there is a God to be accountable to, then what's the point of trying to modify your behavior to keep it within acceptable ranges? That's how I thought anyway. In July 1994, a fellow inmate, Osvaldo Dorothy, attempted to slash Dahmer's throat with a razor embedded in a toothbrush as Dahmer returned to his cell from Roy Ratcliffe's weekly church service conducted in the prison chapel. Dahmer received superficial wounds and was not seriously hurt in the incident. According to Dahmer's family, he had, been, he had long been ready to die and accepted any punishment which he, had, which he might endure in prison. In addition to his father and stepmother maintaining regular contact, Dahmer's mother, Joyce, also maintained regular contact with her son, although prior to his arrest, the two had not seen each other since Christmas 1983. Joyce Dahmer related that in her weekly phone calls, whenever she expressed concern for her son's physical well-being, Dahmer responded with comments to the effect of, It doesn't matter, Mom. I don't care if something happens to me. Chapter 5 Yin Yang On the morning of November 28th, 1994, Dahmer left his cell to conduct his assigned work detail. Accompanying him were two fellow inmates. Jesse Anderson, and Christopher Scarver. The trio was left unsupervised in the showers of the prison gym for approximately 20 minutes. At approximately 8.10 a.m., Dahmer was discovered on the floor of the bathrooms of the gym, suffering from extreme head and facial wounds. He had been severely bludgeoned about the head and face with a 20-inch metal bar. His head had also been repeatedly struck against the wall in the assault. Although Dahmer was still alive and was rushed to a nearby hospital, one hour later, the Milwaukee cannibal was pronounced dead. Anderson, had also, Anderson, who had also been beaten with the same instrument, died two days later from his wounds. Scarver, who was serving a life sentence for murder committed in 1990, informed authorities that he had first attacked Dahmer with the metal bar as he, Dahmer, was cleaning a staff locker room, before attacking Anderson as he, Anderson, 
cleaned an inmate locker room. According to Scarver, Dahmer did not yell or make any noise as he was attacked. Immediately after attacking both men, Scarver, who was thought to be schizophrenic, returned to his cell and informed a prison guard, God told me to do it. Jesse Anderson and Jeffrey Dahmer are dead. Scarver was adamant he had not planned the attacks in advance. Although he later divulged to investigators, he had concealed the 20-inch iron bar used to kill both men in his clothing shortly before the killings. Upon learning of his death, Dahmer's mother, Joyce Flint, responded angrily to the media. Now, is everyone happy? Now that he's bludgeoned to death, is that good for everyone? The response of the families of Dahmer's victims was mixed, although it appears most were pleased with his death. The district attorney who prosecuted Dahmer cautioned against turning Scarver into a folk hero, noting that Dahmer's death was still murder. On May 15, 1995, Scarver was sentenced to two additional terms of life imprisonment for the, murder, for the murders of Dahmer and Anderson. Although Scarver had confessed in 1994 to having concealed the weapon used to kill Dahmer and Anderson in his clothing on the morning of the murders, in 2015, he publicly stated the murders of Dahmer and Anderson had resulted from a confrontation in which one of the two men had poked him, Scarver, in the back as the three had begun their assigned work detail. In this, in this renewed account of events, Scarver claimed the two had laughed at him when he had turned around in response before Dahmer and Anderson each walked to separate rooms to begin their cleaning duty, with Scarver following Dahmer toward the staff locker room. Scarver alleges that immediately before murdering Dahmer, he had cornered him, presented a newspaper article detailing Dahmer's crimes, and demanded that Dahmer answer whether the account was true. Scarver further alleged that he had been revolted by Dahmer's crimes and that Dahmer had been openly unrepentant, that Dahmer taunted prison employees and fellow inmates by shaping his prison food into imitations of severed limbs complete with ketchup to simulate blood spattering, and that prison staff, knowing of Scarver's hatred for Dahmer, had deliberately let the two men unsupervised so that he could kill him. Furthermore, Scarver stated that Dahmer was so disliked by fellow inmates that he required a personal escort of at least one guard whenever he was out of his cell to prevent inmates from attacking him. Dahmer had stated in his will he wished for no services to be conducted, that he wished to be cremated. In September 1995, Dahmer's body was cremated, and the ashes divided between his parents. Dahmer's estate was awarded to the families of 11 of his victims who had sued for damages. Although victims' relatives stated the motivation was not greed, the announcement sparked controversy. A civic group, Milwaukee Civic Pride, was quickly established in an effort to raise the funds to purchase and destroy Dahmer's possessions. The group pledged over $400,000 for the purchase of Dahmer's estate. Five of the eight families represented by Jacobson agreed to the terms, and Dahmer's possessions were subsequently destroyed and buried in an undisclosed Illinois landfill. On August 5th, 1991, a candlelight vigil was a candlelight vigil to celebrate and heal the Milwaukee community was attended by more than 400 people. Present at this vigil were community leaders, gay rights activists, and family members of several of Dahmer's victims. Organizers stated that the purpose of the vigil was to enable Milwaukeeans to quote unquote share their feelings of pain and anger over what happened. The Oxford Apartments at 924 North 25th Street where Dahmer had killed 12 of his victims, were demolished in November 1992. The site is now vacant. Alternate plans to convert the site into either memorial garden or playground, or to reconstruct the new housing, have failed to materialize. Lionel Dahmer is retired now, 
and lives with his second wife, Shari. Both have refused to change their surname, surname and have professed their love of Jeffrey in spite of his crimes. In 1994, Lionel published a book, A Father's Story, and donated a portion of the proceeds from his book to the victims' families. Most of the families showed support for Lionel and Shari, although three families subsequently sued Lionel for two, three families subsequently sued Lionel Dahmer. Two for using their names in the book without obtaining prior consent, and a third family, that of Stephen Hicks, filing a wrongful death suit against Lionel Dahmer, Shari, and former wife. Joyce, citing parental negligence as the cause for the claim. Joyce Flint died of cancer in November 2000. Prior to her death, she had attempted suicide on at least one more occasion. Jeffrey's younger brother, David, changed his surname and lives in an anomaly 